Ya'amod Austin ben Yochanan. Barhu et Adonai Hamavarak. Baruch Adonai Hamvarak Leolam Vayed. Baruch Adonai Hamvarak Leolam Vayed. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Asher Baharbanu Mikol HaAmin. Benatan Lanu et Torah To. Baruch Ata Adonai. No tain ha Torah. Amen. Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed forever and ever. Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed forever and ever. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all people and has given us your Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord giver of the Torah. This morning's reading comes from Deuteronomy chapter 26, beginning at verse 1. Now when you enter the land that Adonai, your God, is giving you as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it, you are to take some of the first of all the produce of the soil which you gather from your land that Adonai, your God, is giving you. Put it in a basket and go to the place Adonai, your God, chooses to make his name dwell. You are to go to the Kohen in charge in those days and say to him, I declare today to Adonai, your God, that I have entered into the land Adonai swore to our fathers to give us. The Kohen is to take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of Adonai, your God. Then you are to respond before Adonai, your God. My father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down to Egypt and lived there as an outsider, few in number. But there, were, there he became a great nation, mighty and numerous. The Egyptians treated us badly, afflicted us and imposed hard labor on us. Then we cried out to Adonai, God of our fathers, and Adonai listened to our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. Then Adonai brought, out, brought us out from Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land a land flowing with milk and honey. So now, look, I have brought the first of all of the fruits of the soil that you have given me, Adonai. Then you are to set it down before Adonai your God and worship before Adonai your God. You will rejoice in all the good that Adonai your God has given, you, given to you and to your house, you, the Levite and the outsider in your midst. When you finish tithing the full tenth of your produce in the third year, the year of the tithe, you are to give it to the Levite, to the outsider, to the orphan and to the widow, so that they may eat within your town gates and be satisfied. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan Lanu Torat Emet Vikaye Olam Nata Bitukenu Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah Amen <clears throat> Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the law of truth and has planted everlasting life in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Wonderful. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome. And welcome to our online congregation. Glad you could be here. Thanks for joining us this day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> 
Blessed Lord our God, we thank you for this beautiful Shabbat day. We thank you that you are indeed the giver of the Torah. Help us this day, Lord, to hear your Torah. Give me the words to speak. Give us all ears to hear, minds to understand. And Lord, I pray that this word will be written on our hearts and will transform us and change us as you would have us be changed. And I pray all these things in the name of our beautiful Messiah, Yeshua. Amen. Well, it is my great honor to be here to deliver the message to you today. Michael is still on prayer retreat, and so I get the honor of coming up and speaking before you. As most of you know, I'm Josh Taze. I'm the one who gives the adult Shabbat class, and as uh, Phil said earlier, I go through the weekly parashiot, the Torah portions, laid down thousands of years ago that have been followed in an annual cycle by the Jewish people and still are today. So when we do this, we're all in sync, all over the world right now, all looking at this. Today's Torah portion is Ki Tavo. So since that's what I teach over there when I come here, that's what I'm going to teach here. It's pretty predictable. Um, Ki Tavo, it means when you enter. It's one of the parashiot that we read every year during the month of Elul, which we have entered now. We're well into. The month of Elul is the month leading up to the fall festivals. Uh, the day of Yom Trua, or Rosh Hashanah as it is known, is coming up. It is a month of introspection, time for us to look inside ourselves and to assess ourselves so that we can prepare for repentance which is the goal of this time of year. The Torah portions during the month reflect, therefore, messages of warning, but also messages of comfort, because we serve the God of mercy and forgiveness. The associated Haftorahs, the, the prophetic portions that go along with these, are taken almost exclusively, well, exclusively, from the prophet Isaiah. This week's strikes a tone of great hope. I just wanted to share it with you because it is such a beautiful thing. Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3, burst forth with great joy in a message of Messiah. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the people's. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. It's a fitting accompaniment for our Torah portion. I like that reference to koshek, darkness, thick darkness, not over the earth, but over people. In other words, a lack of understanding. So let's hope that today's Torah portion will help us to see a little clearer through that darkness. As a background, briefly, um, let me say something that if you're in my class, this is where you can start to take the nap because I say it all the time. <clears throat> the book of Deuteronomy, or Devarim, as it is known, the words, represents the Midrash of Moshe, Moses' 40-day sermon on the plains of Moab. It's the teaching that he gave to the children of Israel as encouragement, as warning, as admonition, and as farewell, because they were about to enter the promised land, but he was not. So <clears throat> at the beginning of the, the entire book of Deuteronomy, it says this in uh, Deuteronomy 1.5. It says, in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, after he had struck down Sihon, king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshvan and Og, king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth and Edre, across the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses began to explain this Torah saying. So explain, ba'ar, means to make plain or make clear. So he began to make clear the Torah. So Deuteronomy is a teaching where Moshe is making the Torah clear to Israelites. And he's able to do that because God himself explained it to him in great detail. He is also able to see into the future because God showed him that. The portion that we're looking at today 
starts with a very joyous section concerning tithing, both the, the first fruit of the land and the tithes during the Shemitah cycle. <clears throat> Moshe knows and teaches to the Israelites that they will enter the land. It's not a might or a maybe you will. It is a you will enter the land, though he will not. He knows that they will receive a land flowing with milk and honey. <clears throat> flowing with milk and honey is, is a beautiful idiomatic phrase. It's a way of saying the land will be very productive. So from a biology pr perspective, cows produce milk when they are in good enough physical condition to give birth. Calf production goes down when the productivity of the land goes down and goes up. Conversely, when it goes up. Similarly, bees are able to produce honey only when there are enough flowers to support them. If a hive flows with honey, it's located in a very rich land and productive habitat. So that means that this phrase, flowing with milk and honey, is a very shorthand and beautiful way of saying you're going to enter a very productive land. In fact, the land will be so good that the Levite, the stranger, the orphan, and the widow will also be abundantly provisioned based on only 10% of the productivity of the land. And this is emphasized because caring for those who cannot provide for themselves is one of the central tenets of the Torah. Not only is it specifically commanded as a mitzvah, but it's also what would be called a precept or an underlying principle. It, it is a precept just like loving your neighbor as yourself or loving God with all your heart. These are the central tenets upon which Torah is founded and rests. They are among the basic things that are expected of God's people. Indeed, Moshe has had a vision of the good land and a bright future for those that live as God commanded. Moshe understood that <coughs> the time had come when God would fulfill the promise he had made to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob. That promise includes the land, it includes a covenant people of God, and it includes the blessing of the entire world through them. These three things intertwine like a rope <coughs> such that one does not occur without the other. The promises of God taken together include all three of those elements. Thus, at the point in history described here in this portion of the book of Devarim, God will bring about the promise of the covenant people and the land promise. That third part was, at the time of this, yet to be realized. That promise would take another 1,400 years to be fulfilled in our beautiful Messiah, Yeshua. But for now, God, through Moshe, commands the Israelites to take the first produce of the land, place it in a basket, and bring it to the place that God will choose to establish his name. Now, at this time, again, Jerusalem would not be chosen for another 400 years or so. So, <clears throat> at first, these offerings were brought to places like Shiloh and Shechem, other places that were very important. But here is the interesting part that I'd like to focus on today. The offerer is to declare, I acknowledge this day before the Lord my God that I have entered the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to assign us. He was to acknowledge the promise and that the promise had been personally fulfilled to him as an individual. This points to the importance of a very personal relationship with the God of the universe. After that, he was to recite the following. My father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down to Egypt and sojourned there, few in number. But there he became great and mighty populous nation. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us and imposed labor on us. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror and with signs and wonders. And he has brought us to this place and has given us this land 
a land flowing with milk and honey. Now behold, I have brought the first produce of the ground, or the soil, which you, O Lord, have given me. This joyous declaration proclaims that the faithfulness of God is in the life of the individual, as well as demonstrating the connection of the individual to the entire community of Israel. The, off the offerer went through a long process to get to this point. He had to identify the first fruit as it was budding. He had to mark it so it was set apart. He had to nurture it and then eventually harvest it carefully and then carefully place it in a basket and then make a journey, a pilgrimage to a very special place to make this offering. All of this individual effort going to honor God acknowledged his providence in the person's life and demonstrated the individual's faithfulness to the community and God's faithfulness to the community. And this was to be done annually. Remember it said to the priest who will be serving in those days, so annually one is to do this. This process would serve to keep a person focused throughout the year on the fact of the fulfillment of God's promises. The first fruits offering goes a long way towards living a God-focused life and never lets one forget that he has nothing except what God has given to him. And another very important principle in the first fruits for us to learn is that the dedication of the first fruits blessed the whole harvest that came thereafter. If we are diligent to intentionally identify and set apart the first fruits of our labor, then all that comes after it is blessed. In fact, the harvest can't be blessed unless the first fruits are thus dedicated. So now we may not live in the promised land, but we do dwell in the community of Israel that God has been faithful to all this time. So this first fruits is the foundation of our tithing when we take from the first of the increase that God has given us and turn it back to him in accomplishing his tasks. Whatever godly charity you support, this congregation or other ministries, it doesn't really matter. It's important for us to recall that this Torah of the first fruits so that it doesn't become a thoughtless habit. The principle of a prayerful declaration before God, recounting his faithfulness to us individually and to the promises he made all those centuries ago to Abraham will give us a spiritual deep meaning to our tithing. Another example of how the Torah brings us closer to our God by giving us a solid rock on which to base our lives. Speaking of rocks, there's another part of this I'd like to highlight this Torah portion. We didn't read it here, but hopefully you've all read this Torah portion for this week before you got here, right? Amen. <laughs> this Torah portion also instructs that upon entering the land, the Israelites are to set up massive stones covered in plaster and very clearly inscribe on them the words of the Torah. These stones are to be set up and used as an altar at Shechem, that, you will remember, is the place where Abraham received the promise for the land. It's a place where Abraham himself built an altar, also for that monumental event. Now here, in this Torah portion, God re-emphasizes this place by having the Israelites build another altar at the same site to stand as a monument to the world that declares that Israel did not come to the land as an invading army or a group of settlers who don't belong, but rather received the land because of the grace of God. And what is the sign of the grace of God on these stones? It's the terms of the covenant, which God graciously blessed them. It's the Torah that at a future time, as both Isaiah and Micah tell us, will go forth from the Holy Land. And if something is going forth from one place, that means it is going forth to all the other places. 
The fact that we are talking about the Torah in September of 2019 in Tucson, Arizona, <clears throat> halfway around the world, is proof enough that the prophet's prediction is unfolding even now. I just don't want us to lose fact, lose sight of the fact that we are part of this living process. This isn't just some book. It's a living book. It's happening here in our lives. This Torah portion describes a joyous and monumental event that after all those wanderings, after all those hundreds of years of people born without borders, taken out of another people, actually exist and have come to possess the land just as God had promised. Perhaps we can learn a lesson from their patience and their faithfulness. God remembers his promises, and he remembers them in his time. May we be likewise ready to accept his gifts when the time comes. Now, we can't talk about this particular Torah portion without noting a very difficult part of it. And that is, this is the blessing and the curse. Moshe here appears to see into the future, and I believe he did, to a time when the Israelites will fall away and slip into the depths of apostasy. He sees that in the future, they will not maintain the idyllic Torah observant life that God has given to them. He sees a time when they will slip back into the era of polytheism and greed and sin and will be scattered among the nations. In fact, Moshe was shown a future that includes the days we now live in. In order to show the Israelites that they have a choice to make, God commanded in this Torah portion that Moshe give to the Israelites a ceremony for when they entered the land. They were to divide the elders of the tribes and send some to Mount Ebal and some to Mount Gerizim. The Levites stood in the valley between with the Ark of the Covenant before all the people in that valley. The elders on one side pronounced the blessing and those on the other the curse, as it says, in a loud voice that all Israelite would hear. These commandments that Moshe gave to Israel in this parsha could be carried out by, would be carried out, and you'll see it in, in Joshua chapter eight. I don't have the slides for that, but that's part of your homework assignment today. Go home, read Joshua chapter eight, and see that they actually did this when they got in there. So picture the scene. Joshua leads the people to the place that God commanded, Mount Gerizim, has on it half the elders, and next to them large stones covered in plaster with the Torah written on it. On the other side are the other half of the elders on Mount Ebal and no stones with them. In the valley is the ark and the Levites and all the people spread from the foot of one mountain to the foot of the other. And they heard the blessings and the curse. This was a large ceremony intended to memorialize the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise and to emphasize the importance of walking in God's ways. It was placing before the Israelites a very in a very visual and tangible way an actual choice. The presence of the elders atop the mountain, the plastered stones, the presence of the ark itself would drive home the gravity of the moment. They stood, if you will, in a valley of decision as they heard what it means to make a good choice and what it means to make a bad choice. <coughs> what is the good choice? It is, is it merely following the commandments? Are you good for just following the mitzvot of the Torah? Just make sure you do all these little details and you'll be fine. Sometimes it's hard, but if you want the reward, that's what you do. Well, while the world is certainly a better place when the children of Israel are in the promised land doing mitzvot, it is not enough, as God has told us repeatedly through the prophets, to simply do the mitzvot by rote. Hosea uh, chapter 6, verse 6, he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And in Micah chapter 6, what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. No, merely keeping mitzvot by rote is not enough. 
If you thought that this was the main take-home message of Kitavo, then you missed the central teaching of Moshe in his farewell sermon that make up the entire book of Devarim. I think the role of Torah in a person's life has generally suffered <coughs> greatly in this church age and the teaching over the millennia, which has looked on it very negatively as the law. In general, the teaching has been what the theologians call antinomianism, anti-law. It sees the Torah as simply a list of do's and don'ts that has been made irrelevant since the work of Jesus. And it accuses Judaism of being a religion of works, one where a balance sheet is kept. Your good must outweigh your bad. Salvation comes to those with the most good and the least bad. But actually, nothing could be further from the truth. This is not what the Torah teaches. Let's hear what the Torah has to teach us from these admonitions, as they're called. From these admonitions, which are stated in the negative, we can hear the thrust of what God sees as important. That is, you can hear the underlying precept. I'll read a little bit and we can kind of look at them. It says, Cursed be anyone who makes a sculptured or molten image abhorred by the Lord, a craftsman's handiwork, and sets it up in secret. Cursed be he who insults his father. Cursed be he who moves his fellow countryman's landmark. Cursed be he who misdirects a blind person. Cursed be he who subverts the rights of the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. Cursed be he who lies with his father's wife, for he has removed his father's garment. Cursed be he who, who lies with any beast. Cursed be he who lies with his sister, whether daughter of his father or of his mother. Cursed be he who lies with his mother-in-law. Cursed be he who strikes down his fellow countrymen in secret. Cursed be he who accepts a bribe in the case of murder. And cursed be he who does not uphold the terms of the teaching of this covenant. If you listen to what that was talking about, it talked about things like idolatry and the commandment to honor your parents and cheating and land dealing and harming the vulnerable, subverting the rights of strangers and fatherless and widows, sexual immorality, shows up in there about four times. I wonder if that's a problem among humans. Assault and murder is in there. Bribery is in there. In summary, anyone who does not uphold the teachings of Torah, which are not, which are not for those awful things. <clears throat> when I heard in there the things that are most important to God, in fact, so important that he says one will be cursed if you commit these acts. He lists the things that will happen associated with this kind of lifestyle in the next part of this, the next chapter. And they're all pretty severe. What is important to God is that his children will keep from idolatry, walk honorably, seek justice, show mercy to the vulnerable, shun sexual immorality, and embody kindness and justice. In other words, base everything on love love of God and love of neighbor. With the annual timing of this Parsha, we read these things every year at this time. That is in the month of Elul, during the 40 days when we consider what we should repent from as we approach Rosh Hashanah Yom Truah. Not because reading the curses is supposed to crush our spirits, but precisely the opposite because we know that because these things are here, there is also good news. That good news is for those that repent and turn away from these things, forgiveness and blessing is possible. And we are so fortunate to have been born in a time where the necessary work of forgiveness has been accomplished by a humble rabbi from the Galilee who poured out his life on a tree so that we could have a change in our hearts. This humble rabbi knew well the teaching of Moshe from this Torah portion. He knew what we have just read in this portion. He knew Torah because he is the Torah. He knows that truly to walk in his ways, one must have the proper attitude of heart. Two things Moshe gives in this sermon on the plains of Moab are 
1 at verse 26.16. The Lord your God commands you this day to observe these laws and these rules with all your heart and soul. So walking in his ways must be done with all your heart and soul. But still, one could be committed to doing these things with their heart and soul, and something would be missing. The main point of this whole portion hinges, I think, on another verse, and that is at 2847. You see, the curses will come because you would not serve the Lord your God in simcha, in joy, uvetov levav, in gladness of heart. So the central teaching of Moshe in this most important part of his sermon is that you must serve the Lord your God by keeping his mishpatim and hukim, his, his statutes and commands, with all your heart and soul in joy and gladness of heart. He's asking you to conduct your life with Torah as your guide and to do this in joy and gladness of heart. According to Moshe, it's serving God with joy and gladness of heart that is most important. So when this humble Galilean rabbi, this Yeshua, came and taught his disciples, and they left us the testimony of his ministration on earth, did he teach anything different than Moshe? Or did he perhaps amplify that? Let's go to Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. He's at this point going after certain of the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others, you blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. If you will notice the reference to tithing in here, links this admonition directly to today's Torah portion. Just as a few, in, in just a few words, Yeshua made a very clear point. Those three things are a summary of the positive message we just derived from those admonitions, those curses that we just read. Justice is often another translation of the word tzedakah or righteousness and covers the warnings against immorality and unfair dealing. Mercy covers the admonitions against harming widows and orphans and strangers. In other words, the most vulnerable of society. Faithfulness epitomized in the admonition against idolatry. And in his statements, these, <coughs> and, and his statement that these things you ought to have done without neglecting the others is very closely related phrase to chapter 27, verse 26. Cursed be he who will not uphold the terms of this Torah and observe them. So let's look at another place where he taught. John chapter 15, verses 7 through 14. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Joyfulness of heart is another way to say that your joy may be full. These are the keystone Torah teachings given to us by Messiah. So that's Messiah. What did Paul say? Since Paul is another great rabbi teacher. He also taught that the true halakha, the true walking with God, requires the attitude of the heart to be right. Given what we know about Ki Tavo, that it starts with the image of the first fruits and shows us the blessing and the curse, but tells us that our life with God is all about following him with all our heart and soul, and that we do it in joy and gladness of the heart, let's take a fresh look at the substance and imagery of Paul in Romans. Remember that the, when the Israelites took to the land, they were to bring the first fruits in a basket and place it before the altar of the Lord. This act served a very important purpose. 
the giver acknowledged God's sovereignty. Did Paul teach anything different than Moshe? Here's in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not subject itself to the Torah of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So it seems that the flesh has an affinity to the things that bring about the curse listed in today's Torah portion. Further on chapter, in that chapter, Paul teaches, For the anxious longing of the creation awaits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for adoption as the sons, the redemption of our body. This is pretty remarkable if you heard what Paul just said. It means that the principle of the Torah of first fruits is a universal principle. Paul tells us that the whole creation awaits the sons of God. It's eager because all of creation's status changed at the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. He tells us that those that accept Yeshua and receive the spiritual transformation that comes with it have the first fruit of the Spirit. That implies that we are the basket, the vessel bearing the spiritual first fruits before God, and the dedication of our lives to God through the harvest of Yeshua blesses not just the harvest of souls that come behind us, but magnificently blesses the whole of creation, which will be set free at the time of the resurrection from its slavery to corruption and enter into the freedom that is the glory of the children of God. This is made possible by the epitome of faithfulness because of the one who did the ultimate act of faith, that is our Yeshua. It was his work and he stands as clearly the first fruits. In order to complete the mitzvah of the first fruits, remember what we just saw, the Israelite had to carefully select and mark and nurture and harvest the fruit. Then he had to gather it together in a basket and bring it before the Lord in a very special place between the altar and the curtain of the tabernacle. The bearer of the first fruits had to acknowledge Wherefore, I now bring the first fruits of the soil which you, O Lord, have given me. Now, the word for soil is Adama, the word related to mankind, Adam, Adam. So with that in mind, I'd like to show you something. I'd like you to consider John chapter 17, now in the light of what you know of the Torah of the first fruits. In John chapter 17, around verse 6, Yeshua is saying this, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you <clears throat> have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on the behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, 
for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And a little later, he goes on to say, for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word, that they might all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, I may be asking you to stretch a little bit here, and I realize this isn't the usual interpretation of those chapters, but can you hear what Yeshua was doing there? now that you know the Torah of the first fruits, It was perhaps the most eloquent declaration of first fruits ever uttered. I've only quoted a few verses here, but again, more of your homework today. Go home and read John chapters 16 and 17 in light of the Torah of the first fruits. It's my heartfelt hope that you may realize the profound and expansive gift that we all have been given, that you will realize that coming to faith in Yeshua was not just an act for yourself, but is in fact a critical element paving the way for the blessing of the entire world. <clears throat> if you're listening to this online or wherever you might be, and you have not come to understand how important it, Yeshua is in your life, it's my hope that you will see the Torah of the first fruits perfected in Yeshua, and that you too will desire to be in that basket of the first fruits that Yeshua is presenting before God as seen in John chapter 17. For the sake of both you and of all creation. If you have any questions, if you feel moved, if you haven't known Yeshua yet, I ask you, please come up. Any one of us can talk to you about that. So let's take a moment and contemplate the fact that we are the first fruits presented before God. Let's pray silently for a moment, and then I'll close us out in prayer. Blessed Lord our God, I thank you for this Shabbat day. I thank you for this wonderful congregation. I thank you for all the members of it, for the first fruits of your work, O oh Lord. I lift up to you many who are ailing and sick this day. I lift up to you uh, Joe Greco's mother. I lift up to you Jack and Athena. And Lord, all those others who I don't know about right now, but you know, Lord, who are in need of healing, who are in need of protection and guidance. Lord, collectively, we lift up our hearts to you that you might answer the prayers of all those in the congregation. And I pray these things in the name of our Messiah, Yeshua. Amen. Thank you. Will you rise up? Yiverech Adonai v'yishmerecha Ya'el Adonai panav lecha v'ikuneka Yisa Adonai panav lecha V'yosem lecha shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his light upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, his peace. In the name of Sar Shalom, Prince, Prince of Peace, Yeshua Mishicheinu, Yeshua our Messiah. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you. Shabbat Shalom.